it's my humble opinion that there is nobody who is better suited to talk about and understand the situation <laughs> in the Middle East and convey it to us in a succinct and meaningful manner in the whole world, I think, other than Dr. Mordechai Kadar, and it is an honor and a privilege to have him back. Thank you very much, Rabbi, and thank you very much to Esa. Yeah, the camera brought me. He all the way down from the Yannick area. And uh, thank you very much to you, Ladies and gentlemen, who got out of home in such a warm evening. <laughs> uh, what's the temperature outside? Minus 16. Minus 16, what? Celsius. Oh, hope my wife doesn't go to the internet to see me. <laughs> um, ladies and gentlemen, usually I don't uh, start uh, my presentations with jokes, because when it comes to the Middle East, things are very serious. <coughs> However, when the situation becomes so bad, people in the Middle East start making jokes out of the situation. Because what else is there to do if not to laugh? So when the situation is so bad, let's start laughing. This is the mindset. Could be in other areas of the world. So they talk, they tell a joke, a joke which I would like to bring. The joke talks about President George W. Bush, who was challenged by the, by the media, political figures in the United States, that the whole war on Iraq in 2003 was unjustified because they never found any weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Now, in Arabic, they don't say weapons of mass destruction. They say weapons of total destruction. This is the term in Arabic, weapons of total destruction. That's the problem. So the joke says that George W. Bush, in order to justify the war, the war retroactively, sent a delegation to the Middle East to look for weapons of total destruction. So he gave them a permit to look everywhere, to dig everywhere, to open every door, every storage, every home, everywhere that we wanted, in order to find weapons of total destruction. So they went all the way from Morocco in the west, all the way to Iraq in the east, from Syria in the north to, the, to Yemen in the south, and they looked for weapons of total destruction. They, they dug everywhere, they opened every door, every storage, everywhere, and they did not find any weapons of total destruction. After a year of searches, of search, they went back to, the, to Washington DC and they went to uh, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, you know, the White House, and they went to the Oval Office and they met with President George W. Bush. He meets them, says, my dear delegation, I sent you a year ago to the Middle East to look for weapons of total destruction. What did you find? So the head of the delegation uh, stands at the feet and said, Dear President, we went everywhere, we dug everywhere, we looked for, for weapons of total destruction everywhere, we opened every door, every storage, and we did not find any weapons of total destruction. George W. Bush becomes angry. What do you mean you didn't find? Everybody says that those arms have weapons of total destruction. Our intelligence said that they have, even the Israelis claim that they have weapons of total destruction. What did you find? So they answer, total destruction. <laughs> <laughs> this, this, this joke is actually being told in Arabic by Arabs who express their feelings when they see what happens in the Arab world by this kind of joke, that our countries, our states, our Arab world, well, actually, 
in a situation of total destruction, total demise, if you would uh, translate it to a good English. I think demise is the word. Why is it? Why is, it, why, why, why is this feeling uh, uh, being overwhelmed today in the, in the Middle East? And by the way, I dedicated to this issue my weekly article, which is supposed to be uh, published uh, these hours on my website after being translated to English. I refer you to this to the website. What happens there which creates such a feeling all over the Middle East? The states of the Middle East were established not by the local peoples of the Middle East, but by the colonialism. The English, the French, and the Italian. When I talk about the English colonialism, I talk about uh, Bangladesh, and Pakistan, and Afghanistan. I start from, from Asia to the West. Uh, Bangladesh, uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, Jordan, what happens in Eretz Israel, uh, uh, Egypt, Sudan, Yemen, the Emirates, uh, these are all British former uh, countries which were <coughs> under British control. Uh, Syria, Lebanon, Algeria, Tunisia, Morocco are states which uh, France was the guardian for a while, occupier for a while, mandatory for a while, depends where, and actually France is the state which brought them to the world as states. And when it comes to Libya, uh, Libya was controlled by Italy, and also the southern part of Sudan and Eritrea, inside East Eastern Africa. So definitely the borders of the states in the Middle East were marked by Westerners for the interests of the Westerners, uh, not for the good of the local peoples of the Middle East. Why? Because, because they couldn't care less about the nations or the ethnic groups or the tribes or the religious groups or the sectarian groups of the Middle East. Who cares about them? We need the oil, we need the resources, we need the people who, you know, to support us and we need the passage through the Suez Canal to go to India when it comes to the late 19th century, and we need them, we need them, we need them, we need them. Let, them, let the whole Middle East serve us. This was the mindset of those colonialists who shaped those states. As a result, those states, I'm talking about most of the states of the Middle East, which I mentioned, are conglomerates of ethnic groups like Arabs, like Kurds, Turkmens, uh, Armenians, uh, Baluchis, Aymakis, all kinds of ethnic groups which probably you never heard about. Uh, tribes, uh, Iraq is 74 tribes, <coughs> Libya 160 <coughs> tribes, Sudan more than 600 tribes. Okay, uh, fragmented as they are, yeah, many tribes. Um, eth um, religious groups, in Iraq there are like 10 religions, only in Iraq. Muslims, Christians, Jews, Sabais, Mandei, Zoroastrian, Zoroastrians, Yazidis, Alawis, Baha'is, you name it, every religion in the Middle East exists in Iraq. And sects, who knows of it? I mean, because some religious groups are divided to sects, like Sunnis versus Shis, in Islam, and Salafis, and Sufis, and some Christian denominations. So, the, the whole Middle East actually is a, is, is a, a mosaic of groups which never became one group, the states actually failed in replacing the loyalty of the people to the traditional group to be loyal to the modern state which included them all. Unlike in this country, this country was made by immigrants who came to this country in order to be Canadians and your neighbor in the South to be Americans and there to share the American dream of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Everyone who came left behind his back the culture of the country which he came from and he came to be an American. Of course, the first generation still carries the culture, but the second generation, which goes to public school, 
definitely becomes more integrated. And the third generation, in many cases, do not even know where the grandfather came from because they became Canadians or Americans because it's easy. Why it's easy? Because people came as individuals. And when you come as an individual, so in this apartment, in this apartment building, lives somebody who came from Africa, the next um, apartment, somebody who came from Russia, the next apartment, somebody who came, came from China and, 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 and Japan, and some country in South Africa or South America, and so forth. And their children are going to the same school, same public school. This is why when you talk about individuals, it is easy to put them all in a melting pot and to forge, to a large extent, a new society <coughs> made of all of them together, which functions the society definitely after a generation or two. But when you come to the Middle East and you see <coughs> groups of hundreds of thousands of people, in some cases millions of people, who share all the same culture, the same minds, the same language, the same religion, which is different, all different from the next group, which has their own dialect of Arabic or another language, and with their religion, their, their minds and their leadership, and the worst fighting militia, armed to its teeth, because every group holds its own militia in order to deter the others from, inter from interfering in its own business. So when this is the society, not individuals, but groups of hundreds of thousands of people, it is very hard to merge them together and to forge new society, new culture. Because this, these are big communities which serve, which preserve their, their identity, sometimes in pain of death. When it comes to tribalism, which in the Middle East is not only alive and kicking, it is alive and killing, the reason is that the space of the Middle East means from Morocco in the, in the West, all the way to Iran in the East, from Syria in the North to Yemen in the South, 95% of the area is dry, arid, desert. Unlike this country, which you take a journey of 10 miles, you cross at least five rivers in some places. Nobody fights on water. Why fight? Everybody can drink as much as he wants. And those uh, rivers are usually good water, which you, can, which you can drink and you can give your cow or your tail. You can uh, uh, irrigate your, your, your land with this. No problem. Why fight? In the Middle East, there are no rivers. Yeah, maybe you have the Nile and you, you have the Euphrates. And the thing is, and that's it. Three, three rivers who do not even come from come from other areas, from Africa when it comes to the Nile, and from Turkey when it comes to the Euphrates and the Tigris. So no rain, no nothing. People, people have to live as tribes in order to um, defend their source of water. Here a spring, or maybe here a well, here a ditch, or here is some puddle which somehow accumulated, and you have to, to defend it in pain of death. Otherwise, you are a dead man, because other group will come and will chase you out. Look, just the temperatures. In Iraq, uh, there, there's no rain in Iraq. The heat is so, so high that if you, in the summer, you take a pen, frying pen, and you break two eggs into it, you put it on the sand, within 10 minutes you have an omelet. Without fire, you don't need a fire. So in such a weather, if you don't defend your source of water, you die to that. You die to that. This is why, by the way, it has an echo in our tradition in, in the Sefer Bereshit, books of Genesis, uh, the, 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 the blessing to Esav. Yitzchak uh, blesses him. Means you will live on your sword because without the sword you will not live. Because these are the conditions in the desert. This is why uh, uh, those tribes are essential in order to survive in the, in the desert. If you are alone, if you are a lonely man, you are a dead man. Because another one will come and kill you in order to take the water. 
So when you come to the Middle East, society is definitely, totally uh, 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 different from the kind of society which we are all, we all share in Canada, the United States, even in Israel. People stick to their traditions and to history, although it's very history. Um, you might remember what happened in Florida in 2000 when the elections between George W. Bush and Al Gore to the presidency. Some hundreds of ballots were unclear. And uh, it was a question who won Florida. And it was as the one who won Florida actually would be the president because all the other states were even. So uh, they went to the Supreme Court, American Supreme Court. The Supreme Court came to the verdict. Uh, about Bush, Bush actually uh, won those hundreds of uh, ballots and Bush became the president. And nobody in the United States of America tried to challenge the legitimacy of George W. Bush by saying that, uh, hey, I was actually uh, voted for Bush. Okay, after the verdict of the Supreme Court, finished. And America had a president for four years, another four years, and that's it. Imagine that the American nation divides to two parts. One part supports uh, George W. Bush, the other part supports uh, Al Gore, and those two parts are fighting each other in an all out war for 14 centuries. <coughs> Impossible, right? This is actually what happens between the Sunnah and the Shia. Exactly this. Why? Because when Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, <coughs> uh, died, uh, the quarrel over the heritage started between two people. One is Ali, one David Ali, the other one, his name is Muawiyah. The Ali, Ali became the fourth caliph. Muawiyah challenged him and took the caliphate to him, became the fifth caliph. And until this very day, the followers of Ali are fighting the follow followers of Muawiyah until this very day. And they killed each other in masses. The war between Iran and Iraq between 1980 and 1988, million people were killed in this war. It's all about Sunnah and Shia. Because Saddam, who led Iraq, was a Sunni, and the Iranians and the Ayatollahs are Shiites. There you are. Another ring in the chain of mass killings between, between uh, the Sunnah and Shia. Uh, you can see how Sunnis are blowing Shi uh, mosques in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, big time, and, uh, and vice versa. When a Shi group uh, in Egypt uh, declared that they became Shia, uh, after a while, they were slaughtered, means beheaded uh, in Egypt. Why? Because, and they are all Muslims, as you know. So, uh, the, 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 the fact that people stick to history, and for 14 centuries they are still fighting on the heritage of Muhammad, who was the right caliph between this and that, there's something which people in these in this areas of the world cannot understand. But it's very, very well understood in the Middle East. Because there, people stick to their traditions, stick to their, their time, stick to their history, stick to their rights, and they will never give, it, give up, even in pain of death. Means they are ready to die in order to win what they have to win. What good will it bring to them if they die? But the Quran can less about this. We want what, what we deserve to have, even if we die. This is some kind of psyche which people cannot uh, the all, I think all, all these armed states which we mentioned, except for the Arab Emirates in the Gulf, are more or less this mindset. These countries, actually, because of the fact that people stuck were stuck to the to the traditional frameworks, look like barrels of, barrels of explosives, because the potential of explosion or implosion was. Uh, uh, very well in, in the air. Yet, they were held by the dictators, Mubarak, Gaddafi, Hussein in, in, uh, in Jordan, Assad, father and Assad son in Syria, Saddam in, in, in Iraq, and 
طيب بن علي ان اندونيسيا ان صفو ان علي عبد الله صالح في اليمن ان ذا سعودي هاوز ان سعودي ابي اول دوز ار ديكتاتورز نيفر بي نيفر بي ليكتد ويل نيفر بي ليكتد اف بيبل اف ذا بيبل هاد ذا تشويس تو فوت فور ذيم بيكوز ذا كنترول ذا كانتريز ان اوردر تو ان تو تو بريفنت ذا اكسبلوجن اوف ذا امبلوج اوف ذيس كار Iran is also some kind of dictatorship. Was it secular dictatorship under the Shah until 1970, the end of 1978, and became an Islamic dictatorship under, since 1979? So the dictatorship anyway, because Iran also is a conglomerate of of uh, ethnic groups like Persians who are not even half of the country yet control it. Uh, Azeris, Kurds, Baluchis, Arabs, Armenians, okay, they never mingled with each other, they never became one nation, they never became one group of people, every one of them is still uh, uh, loyal to the traditional framework, and if, if the state was not a dictatorship, it would for long ago, uh, uh, was, uh, uh, would fall apart. Uh, between all these. And there is actually a very vicious insurgency inside Iran between this, the government uh, and the Baluchis in the south. Baluchis are Sunnis. They are not even Shiites. They are not Arabs and they are not Persians. They are different ethnic groups. By the way, they are bigger than Jews because their number is estimated by like 20 million people. We are not 20 million Jews. Talking about what? 11 million, 12 million, more or less. So the Baluchis. How many of you have heard about Baluchis? <coughs> uh, okay, who knows about this? But they are even bigger than the Jewish nation. And they have a very vicious fighting militia named Jundullah, means the army of Allah. And uh, they blow up uh, Iranian trains and trucks and tanks and, and uh, uh, armored uh, 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 carriers. You know, all kinds of vehicles, and uh, definitely they big, big headache to the Iranian regime. Who hears about this? Nobody. Why? No journalists. There are, so so who, who, who can know about this? The Kurds in the northwest of uh, Iran also are not uh, so uh, quiet as we tend to think. They uh, definitely, once in a while, they act against the local uh, authorities with the the revolutionary guard, and uh, whenever an Iranian soldier goes to the des district of Iran, he has to be accompanied by machine gun, you know, to protect him. So uh, Iran also has its own problems and will one day collapse. Arab states collapse one after the other. Iraq is divided to a Kurdish state, and uh, some of the Arab tribes already declared statehood. Not statehood, full statehood like France and Germany, but statehood like uh, Ontario and uh, British Columbia. Uh, because the central government doesn't function. So the local tribes uh, decide to, uh, as they say now, scratch their backs by their own uh, uh, names. Because they, like, Iman really me. If I don't, if I don't take care of myself, nobody will do it for me. So they, that's how they behave. Sudan was divided uh, two and a half years ago, years ago uh, to northern Sudan uh, in, with the capital Khartoum, and the southern Sudan with the capital Juba, which is not Islamistic. Israel has already in relation with that. And, uh, but, but both, both Sudans keep fighting internally. In North Sudan is the government against uh, Darfur, and in the south, the Dinka tribes who are the government try to subjugate the other tribes who rebel against them. Only recently in Juba there were fights like a thousand people. A thousand people were killed in the streets in a span of like a week of, uh, of uh, fighting inside Sudan. Libya, big time. Those tribes, after they succeeded with the help of NATO, to get rid of, uh, of Gaddafi, now they uh, fight each other. He has estimated number of killed people since Gaddafi started his problems, like three years ago, around 100, 
thousand people. Only. So far. Not final. You know. There will be, unfortunately, more because they continue fighting against each other. Uh, there is good chance that the country, means Libya, will be divided to some three states. One in the west, Tripolitania. One in the east, uh, Cyrenaica. And uh, the south, which is not even Arabs, the Berbers, might have another state uh, in the south. Um, Syria, and this is the worst case, uh, also is, became a bloodbath. Uh, of uh, tears and fire and blood, when the regime so far uh, has killed, burned some hundred, some two hundred thousand people. Two hundred thousand people only because Assad remains in power. Maybe if he go, more people will, will be killed because they will start fighting each other. As it is in, in, in Libya, but uh, definitely when the regime. Uh, takes part in uh, killing its own citizens, it's something uh, uh, outrageous. Yet, I, I don't see the demonstrations every day in Toronto <coughs> or in Montreal against uh, the war in, in Syria. Uh, and this regime actually invented new methods of how to kill its own citizens. Uh, you must have heard about this uh, new phenomenon of killing them by barrels full of explosives which they throw from helicopters. Why don't they, why don't they do this? Why don't they take aeroplanes to, to throw bombs, real bombs? Why don't they have to invent such a primitive uh, way of helicopters with barrels of explosives to throw them, you know, to somebody throws them in the feet? What, what, what's the problem? They used to use aeroplanes. You know, real combat aeroplanes, in order to bomb the people with uh, bombs which can hit the house. But what happened is, some pilots uh, actually threw the bombs in the desert and uh, ran away with the, with the airplane. To Turkey, to Jordan, there is a rumor that one of them even ran, ran away to Israel. Instead of uh, bombing uh, people, he just threw the bombs and uh, continued the way, the way quickly, you know, this uh, jet. Uh, fighter jets, they can fly very fast, and he ran away to Jordan to us because he is the only one in the airplane. There is no place to anyone other, otherwise from the, from the uh, pilot. So what they took, they took helicopters. Helicopters have two drivers, two uh, pilots who drive the, 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 the machine, and behind them there are two intelligence people with guns in their hands, and uh, now there are guns in the airplane because the intelligence do not know how to fly helicopters. For this you need professional pilots. So they took helicopters with two pilots to fly them, and two guard, guard, guns you know, from the intelligence with pistols directed to their heads, and uh, with barrels of explosives. Now they go above a school in, in Aleppo, where if school became uh, you know, a place for the jihadists, so they are above the school and they kick the, the barrels uh, down to explode the, this, uh, to blow up this school. And while guarding the, the pilots and they don't run away with a helicopter to Turkey or to other places. So this is why they invented this, uh, this way, how to kill the whole people. And every barrel like this can kill dozens of people because it's full of like maybe a ton of uh, standard explosives. This is something with very very big impact. Houses can be can, can collapse. Um, you know, hundreds of meters the diameter of uh, of uh, of effect. Uh, this this is something devastating, and this is what how this regime fights its own. Uh, uh, citizens. Uh, and this is unfortunately what happens in these countries. Every one of them uh, becomes a uh, uh, bloodbath. And even states like Jordan uh, is uh, on, the, on the edge. And the king is very much afraid that uh, what happens around him will, uh, uh, be, will be poured into, into Jordan because it's all around him. 
in Iraq, in Syria. Egypt is, not, is unstable. And, uh, and so, so, so definitely the, the, the Middle East today looks really like a mayhem because of everybody fights everybody. Uh, states become dysfunctional. Uh, armies uh, be become the most vicious enemy of their own uh, citizens. And uh, the, the, the mood which overwhelms the Middle East is a mood of uh, total destruction, as the joke, uh, and the sad joke uh, uh, says. Uh, where is Israel when it comes to all this? Uh, uh, a very, very, very difficult question to answer. Because when you don't understand the situation around you, it's very hard to assess what is your situation. Okay? This is why uh, in Israel there is a big debate uh, about the situation. On one side, you see people who say, hey, the whole Arab world is in flames, uh, ideologies became nothing, nobody believed in anything any, anymore in these, in these countries. Um, even the statehood became a uh, madhouse. Not even one idea which, which controlled these countries works. Nothing happens, not, nothing really good happens to, this, to these countries. And armies like the, the Syrian army, uh, actually, which was one, uh, uh, once it was a, a threat on Israel, we don't see this army now anymore as a threat to Israel. Because this army is, I wouldn't say smashed to pieces, but definitely um, uh, suffers from uh, 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 most, many, many of the soldiers just defected right away. And Assad is working with third of the army which he had three years ago. Of course, they, they are still loyal to him, and this is why they fight. But such a small, a small uh, uh, army as it is today, exhausted as it is today, fatigued as it is, definitely does not pose any danger on the state of Israel. To continue, with its 60 or 70,000 missiles, today those combatants of Hezbollah are deeply involved in Syria. So definitely they don't, they don't need another front with Israel now. So Egypt on the south, southwest, we have peace with Egypt. And now with the army which came to power back, uh, definitely this peace uh, is much more uh, secured than it was in the one year of Morsi, the Muslim Brotherhood uh, uh, president was there. So on the Egyptian side, we don't see any threat uh, from the state of, of, uh, of Egypt. In Jordan, as long as the stability in Jordan is maintained, we don't see any real threat from the state of Jordan as well. Syria collapses and being divided between the Kurds and the Alawis and the Druze and the Bedouins and everyone tears apart and uh, makes his, make his own state. Yes. So definitely Syria is not a threat and Hezbollah are preoccupied in, 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 in Syria. So the situation in Israel, the, the bottom line is much better. Peace with some countries and other countries with no peace with Israel are in the to total destruction. So, uh, so uh, we see those who, who see the picture from this angle don't see any threat. So the statue of Israel overall in the Middle East become, became much more secure, much more, much better, and we can breathe <coughs> in some uh, better, uh, better mood. Others show other things. For example, the Islamists. What happens? Because whenever, wherever, there is no law and order in the Arab world, the Islamists come, means the jihadists, the Al-Qaeda-like organizations, come and start to forge their states within the states. Means Islamic states. We already have the IS, what they call the ISIS, uh, the Islamic State of Iraq and Sham or Syria. Uh, this organization, this leader, the Al-Qaeda, uh, I would say, civil um, organization. Al-Qaeda is actually a fighting militia, fighting group. Okay, when they succeed to liberate uh, 
piece of land. They bring those, this ISIS like organization, an Islamic state, which will take care of sewage and supply, water supply and uh, electricity and education, health care and transportation, okay, and supply for, for, for the people, for, you know, for the groceries. This is the Islamic state of whatever. It could be the Sham, in Syria, it could be Iraq, it could be wherever they are. The Islamic state of dot dot dot. Uh, and this is actually the other side of the civilian side of Al Qaeda. The, the, the other side of the coin of Al Qaeda. So the ISIS actually is a set of Al Qaeda. The kind of Al Qaeda state, if, if you can say. It. So the, the already there is one in Syria, in northern Syria, in the areas of Raqqa and Aleppo, where the regime bombs with with uh, uh, barrels. There is one in Iraq, uh, within the Sunni uh, parts of, of Iraq. You might have Fallujah and Ramadi, on the, on these cities in the center and to the west of, of uh, Iraq. We already see these enclaves of Islamic State in Sinai, in Libya, in Yemen, in Sudan, in, uh, you know, I mentioned, in Afghanistan and in Pakistan. Means Al-Qaeda, or oh, Bin, Laden, Bin Laden is dead and he is alive and kicking. Because his legacy actually became something which you can find it in too many uh, uh, places. Uh, and they are trying to expand their space by fighting others, by chasing other house, others out. And wherever there is a lawlessness uh, in this Middle East, you see those jihadists who come from all over the world. They come from the Emirates, from Algeria, from Tunisia, from Chechnya, blonde, or from, from this kind. People, people who either were Muslims and became radicalized and they go to the Middle East to fight, or there are converts to Islam, blonde people who have indigenous English in them, as English speaker, English speakers, and they become Islamists and they go to blow themselves in, 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 in the deserts of Iraq or Syria. There are some hundreds of those who came from Europe, from France, from Belgium, Holland, Germany, either converts or uh, newborn uh, is Islamists, or born again, born, born again uh, Islamists, uh, like Turks, like Kurds, who are the by the way, I don't know if you remember, but in Israel in 2004 we had a, 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 an explosion. Some people were killed in a in a cafe named in, in, in Tel Aviv. Mike's place. Mike's place in Tel Aviv it was made or was perpetrated by Pakistanis from England, whose English is perfect, who came with British passports to Israel as British citizens. And they came to my space and they blew it up. Blew it up. I think three people were killed in this in, in this uh, event. So who can find those? Well, if you remember Richard Reed, the, the terrorist with the shoes, who tried to smuggle bomb it into an airplane. That's why we all have to take off our shoes when we go when we go in to the airplane. So uh, this is actually what happens in these countries. The state is dysfunctional. Borders are do not function because journalists can come from wherever they, wherever they like, wherever, to wherever they like. And uh, 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 enclaves of Islamic State start to emerge on the ruins, or from under the ruins of these dysfunctional states. And this is actually the mayhem of the Middle East, where Israel has to live. Now, there are, the other side of Israel, are viewing these Islamic uh, uh, radical states which start to emerge on the ruins of those armed states. And they say, we prefer the states. I mean Syria and Lebanon. We prefer them because those Al-Qaeda have no restrictions. Who, if they will succeed to put their hands on nuclear weapons or chemical weapons, which they can steal or produce or buy from North Korea, from where, from money, 
what the North Koreans will not sell bomb for money? Yeah, I believe that they will sell. They need the money. So uh, if those Al Qaeda like states uh, become, let's say, more established and more armed, the danger which they can pose in Israel is way much bigger than the dangers which we experience from states like Syria, maybe Iran as well. So between those who see no uh, threat in the, sh in the short uh, future because of the collapse of the states, and those who see a big threat in the long run because of Islamic new states which might take over the space in the Middle East uh, on the wounds of those dysfunctional states, Israel has to find its way how to behave or how to act or how to uh, deal with its neighbors uh, 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 when the dangers are well known. And this is why, by the way, Israel sticks to uh, the Jordan Valley because nobody knows what will be the fate of Jordan, nobody knows what will be in Iraq, and if in the long run these areas become also a part of the Islamic State of Jordan or whatever, means Al Qaeda like uh, state, definitely we have to defend ourselves from the Jordan Valley and not from uh, Tel Aviv. Because when we were in Tel Aviv or in Atania, or 17 kilometers from there where the Green Line was, it will be too, much, too, too late. If you start to defend yourself from there, you have to do it from much to the east in order to defend the state. Uh, this is why today uh, there is almost a consensus to uh, stick to the Jordan Valley uh, in any agreement with the Palestinians. And uh, apparently, this will be uh, one of the issues which they will never uh, agree because they want two things access to Jordan in order to undermine the stability of Jordan, and they want access to the Jordan River because once they have access to the Jordan River and territorial access, they can claim what? Claim the right to the water. Means that Israel will have to give them a part, a half, or no, from, from the, a, a, from the Kinneret, means the water of the Kinneret, which Israel blocks so far. And uh, uh, the whole situation about, and they will have a legal right if they succeed to expand their, their space all the way to the Jordan River. This is why Jordan and Israel are against giving them the uh, Jordan Valley. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, John Kerry understands it, and uh, I think that his plans are a bit uh, different, yet I don't know. To some, the Middle East, no doubt, is in a big mayhem. States which were more functioning for many years, today are almost totally dysfunctional. Um, as, a, as a result, the geopolitics of the Middle East, of, of Middle East changed dramatically, or changed dramatically during the last three years, and the trend is unknown. Where it goes, nobody can predict. Will uh, Islamic states uh, come instead of the uh, old states? It, uh, may, or maybe, on the contrary, hom homogeneous uh, states will, will emerge and they will be much more stable and therefore peaceful. Uh, nobody can predict uh, the real future of the Middle East. This is why it is hard to build a, a policy in such, a, uh, in such an area. Just to give you uh, a, 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 an example for, for, for policies, uh, you know, to shape an army, to make an army, and to arm an army, it needs much money, and it needs much time. You, to train people, to shape the army, to arrange it in a way or another. Uh, if, our, if the threat is a state, you need an army of one kind. If the threat is an Islamic gang, the army should look different different units, different weapons, different uh, intelligence, different everything. You, an army against army is one thing, an army against terrorists is a different, totally different army. 
in its training, in its mindset, in its uh, behavior, and everything. So now, what army does Israel need? An army which will face armies, or an army which will face jihadists? <coughs> because it's a totally different investment in army. And you cannot change the course of an army within a day. After you armed it, after you bought arms and airplanes and, and, and tanks and cannons, and you train people on, to do one thing, and the next day you can you cannot make them into um, an urban warfare warriors, where uh, you need more uh, uh, when you fight jihadists, because urban warfare is totally different thing. In urban warfare, you don't use, you don't you don't use tanks, you don't use cannons, you don't use Air Force, you don't use Navy, no submarines in urban warfare, because you, even if you go in the switch, you don't go with the submarine. So, so it's a totally different uh, uh, military thinking or military strategy when, when your enemy is a state from when your enemy is an Al-Qaeda-like state, as we already see. So what should Israel do? What army, what training, what arms should we buy? How, what an army should be shaped against what target? Nobody really knows. And this is only one of the questions which Israel uh, uh, is in an uncertainty when it comes to planning. And uh, it takes years to plan and, and then to implement it. And when the future is so vague, uh, definitely it is hard to, uh, to plan anything even when it comes to army. When it comes to foreign policy, definitely. We, have, we know how to deal with states. How do you deal with Islamic states? With the Al-Qaeda states? Do you recognize them uh, factually, but you don't talk to them? You, can, you talk to them? Yeah, I, I know. So there are many questions. Just look at the hardships which we have, which we have in Gaza. Because Gaza is another Islamic state uh, which we have to deal with. They are our neighbors for almost seven years. In June, it will be seven years. And uh, some, something which acts like a state, talks like a state, and uh, quacks like a state is a state. OK, so uh, it is a state, whether, whether we like it or not. We might find the same states in Syria, maybe in Lebanon as well, maybe in, in Jordan, maybe in, in, in Sinai or anywhere. <laughs> so this is more or less the two poles of the debate inside Israel uh, as, as it comes to the, what do we see around us. And when you have an argument about the situation, about how to analyze the situation, not what will be in the future, what is today? When you don't understand what happens today, definitely it's hard to plan the future. So this is the mayhem in the Middle East, which creates hardships also within Israel. However, Israel internally, I think, uh, is still, was, it is, and I hope it will be forever, democracy, a flourishing democracy, vibrant democracy, with open media, rights of whoever, women and others, uh, even minorities in Israel, and Arabs. Look, uh, somebody, is, an, an Arab, talked uh, some days ago in the BBC Arabic, I listened to this on the, on the computer, he said that Israel, uh, we should all learn from Israel. Because if Israel will open the borders and the uh, Arabs will freely be able to go to Israel, 100% of the Arab world will ever go to Israel. If Israel uh, allows it. It's not only the Eritreans and Sudanis and that. Every Arab will go to Israel, if he can. Only because our countries are in such a mayhem. Nobody sees any, any uh, future to those, to those countries. And the, the Yehush, it's the it's a Yehush. Despair. Despair. Desperation, despair is so deep, is so deep in these countries that really uh, uh, we cannot even uh, uh, sense uh, to what depth comes today the, the bad feeling in the Arab world when they see that nothing, nothing works. Look, in, in Egypt, which started its arm spring, uh, exactly uh, what, uh, three years ago, 20, 20, 25th of January. <coughs> In two days, we may celebrate the third anniversary. 
of the beginning of the of the of the Arabs in Egypt uh, started with big hopes. Even Thomas Friedman talked about democracy from the Tahrir Square, and everybody was overwhelmed with, with, with those youngsters who came out in the streets. And the biggest achievement was to oust uh, Mubarak. Okay, what do they have today? Sisi, which is actually the same thing. The same general who took the country and rules it with, with his own laws, which he sits and formulates with his wife. So, so, so this is, they ousted Mubarak from the door to find Sisi coming in from the window. So what, what happened in Egypt? So within three, three years, one year they had with the Muslim Brotherhood, and they came back to the exactly the same point which they started the revolution three years ago. They closed the circle and came back to the same to the same point where a military dictator takes the country and, and actually all the hopes which we saw and the people who, who got killed, like uh, 2,000 people in Egypt, uh, got killed through the last three years in demonstrations and the mass killings from the army and so forth. And, and they came to the first uh, square of the game. So, what happened? What, why all this uh, bloodshed and so forth? What? So, where am I going now? After the whole thing was actually came uh, to, the, to the first one. So, this is actually what happens in this unfortunate world, the Arab world. And Israel has to find its way as a democracy, as a country which keeps uh, human rights and political freedoms and minority freedoms. And uh, even when it comes to Arabs in Israel, and Muslims, in, not, not to mention Christians in Israel, because Israel is the only state in the, in the Middle East where the number of Christians is not uh, in decrease. They are there. In all of the Middle East, other there are Arab countries, Christians are running away in big, in big numbers. There are some denominations which don't exist anymore in the Middle East because of this uh, uh, mass immigration uh, from the Middle East of Christians because uh, those Islamists, when they don't have anybody to eat, they get uh, Christians. Why not? Uh, they don't belong in us. In, in our places, uh, we are Islamic world. Why, why should we have it? So this is actually what happens there. And uh, Israel has to find its way uh, between those waves which shake the Middle East, uh, in like Tal Tel a very big, uh, very big shake. I think I'll open the floor for uh, questions. Yes, sir. Uh, Iran and the bomb. What's your take on what's happening there? I don't have any data uh, about the real ad advance of the Iranians to the bomb. There is much information, misinformation, disinformation. But what I'm more than sure is that they feel that they won uh, the war uh, by succeeding to cancel the, the sanctions without giving up on their nuclear military problem. How do I know? They were not forced by the agreement to dismantle the facility which they have in Iraq which has no other meaning but military problem. There is no other use to what they do in, in Iraq. So if the world agree, agrees to leave Iraq as it is, apparently the world accepts the fact that they have military nuclear problem. This is what the, the only thing. And they definitely go around with a good feeling that they won the war against the West because the West is fatigued. The West is like a paper tiger, especially in the United States of America. And uh, the West, because the West wants to invest money in Iran and take out, take out the profits, the West is ready to have a, a nuclear Iran. This is how they interpret it. And the enemies, or well, means the opponents of Iran, like Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, definitely have good reason to feel that they are betrayed by the United States of America and the West in general. So, in all the, 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 the picture you painted of the uh, fractioned Al Qaeda uh, cities, emerging states, uh, against the three major powers, 
not talking about China and Russia, about uh, Turkey, Egypt, and Iran. Uh, you did address much about Turkey. So you're saying, are you saying that the stability of a country is to Israel's benefit? And where does Turkey, so uh, the balance of power between those three countries, if that's, if I'm correct. Uh, that well, Turkey and? And, and Iran and Egypt, which one is the dominant power? Uh, and is that of great importance? And is Turkey the source of stability in the Middle East? Can Not at all. Uh, Egypt, first of all, cannot be compared in any way to Turkey and Iran. Egypt sinks in its own problems, and uh, Egypt as a state uh, doesn't exist. In, in any equation of powers in the Middle East. Egypt has to find how to feed its uh, 90 million people tomorrow, not in a month. Tomorrow they don't know how they will feed them. So uh, Egypt definitely uh, is not in the scale of any state which has any influence on its world. Uh, when it comes to Turkey, Turkey also faces uh, big problems during the last uh, two years and more accelerated during the last months. It started in the, in the Gezi Square uh, demonstrations like uh, seven, eight months ago, when Erdogan had to face uh, people in the street and killed some of them. It continued recently in the investigations of, uh, of uh, corruptness in, in Turkey, in which some ministers had to resign and they sent away all uh, some of the uh, uh, police. Definitely Turkey is not as it was, and the economy of Turkey is not as it was. During the, uh, let's say, until five years ago, they had growth every year of some seven, eight percent, almost like China. But during the last three years, they are at around three, two percent. And it has a very, very, very good influence on the, on the mood, uh, on the employment, on uh, consumption, on consumption, and uh, many indicators uh, indicate that Turkey actually goes to a very deep problem, economic problem, political problem, social problem. So uh, I, I, I also wouldn't consider Turkey as a state which has a big influence on the Middle East. Uh, Iran has, no doubt. Iran, uh, as, as we see today, uh, controls Iraq, will control Afghanistan when the West withdraws from Afghanistan. And the Gulf Emirates like Kuwait, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and the seven Emirates of the United Arab Emirates are shaking, shivering from fear from Iran because they don't see any Western power which can come to save them from the Iranian hegemony. And already the Kuwaiti parliament held twice a discussion whether to join Iran peacefully or not. Whether to become a part of Iran. Because they understand that if Iran will take them over, as Saddam did in 1990, the world will not come again to save them. So if you cannot beat them, join them. So this is what they think in Kuwait. By the way, uh, five years ago, a delegation of Kuwaiti members of the parliament, the Kuwaiti parliament, visited Iran. And they met with a committee of foreign, of, of, uh, foreign relations of the Iranian parliament. And they convened all in the room of the Iranian counterparts to discuss the issues of the Middle East or the Gulf, uh, Borders. So the head of the Iranian committee in foreign relations went to a map, put his hand on Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, you know, the Arab side of the Gulf, and told the, the, the delegates, this area, which, in, which includes Kuwait as well, this area will be ours one day. So what's it? To the Kuwaiti. A delegation. Who was this man? <coughs> Hassan Rouhani, the, the president of today. Okay? 
So when they see those Kuwaitis, when they see today how Rouhani succeeded to get rid of the sanctions <coughs> with keeping the nuclear military program, they actually see his hand actually captures their countries as he did, as he showed them five years ago. Means they had a plan, they know what they do and how to do it, and they did it. I must say, I salute the Iranians for the success to defeat the Western sanctions. Definitely. Big success. Big victory. Yes. What happened is, you know, it's, it's nice when people recycle the news of yesterday. Although today the news are totally different. What happened is that in 2003, when the West uh, occupied Iraq and got rid of Saddam, they immediate, immediately stopped or halted the nuclear program because they were afraid that uh, after the West finished we, finishes with Iraq, uh, they will continue with the troops in the Gulf, maybe to Syria, maybe to Iran, maybe to both, because there were people who called uh, upon the Bush, George W. Bush to do it. Uh, towards the end of 2003, the insurgency in, in Iraq started. Iran was behind it at least uh, the Shi side of the insurgency. Iran gave them money, Iran, Iran trained them, Iran gave them explosives, standard explosives, <coughs> which are very dangerous, uh, weapons, ammunition, whatever they needed, and communications, so they can communicate with each other without the Americans uh, listening to them. And even um, uh, people who belong to the uh, to the revolution, revolutionary guard came to Iraq to take part in the insurgency, usually behind behind the, the ranks. It started in 2004, continued until 2003, and then 5 and 6. And the Americans and the others had all the evidence that Iran is deeply involved in the insurgency. And the world did not do anything against Iran, although they had all the evidence. So in the time, towards 2006, when they see that America has the evidence, and, and actually America captured some Iranian uh, revolutionary guard people and investigated them, and the Iranians knew that they were caught and what information they gave, and every, and every reason was there in order to attack Iran for the part which Iran takes in the insurgency in Iraq. You know, the Americans sacrificed almost five, almost 4,500 4, soldiers in Iraq. In my estimation, at least 3,000 of them were killed because of the Iranian intervention. And, they, and the Americans do it very well. And the Americans didn't do, didn't do anything against it. Means that the, the, the Iranians understood that America becomes a paper tiger. So they renewed their nuclear program, the military one, as of 2006. So you're right. Between 2003 and 6, it was halted, but it was renewed. Today, there are people who still oh, fell asleep in 2004 <coughs> and didn't wake up since to see that the Iranians renewed this. I hope. Look, whenever they feel, whenever they feel that there is a, a credible, a credible threat, they behave. You know, it, it happened it, it went before. You might remember in 1979, right after the revolution, they invaded the American embassy, and they caught 53 diplomats, American diplomats, and they 
and they held them in prison, which is totally, totally forbidden when you come from diplomats, uh, 444 days. 444. In the days of uh, Jimmy Carter. When were they released? Those 53 diplomats? The minute which Ronald Reagan raised his hand, he sent them a message. Bef after he was elected in November, before he came to power in January, between the elections and coming to power, coming to office, that the minute he walks into the White House, he will deal with them. And they better be very careful, because he will flatten Tehran if they don't release the people. They took it seriously. Listen, they took it seriously. The, he, the, when he raised his hand, a, a, a swearing allegiance to the Constitution, the airplane which carried those 53 people left the Iranian airspace. This is when it happened. Because they sensed a credible threat. Means only when the Iranians sense a credible threat, they act according to the... And you know why? You know why? They feel that their leaders, Khomeini formerly and Khamenei now, are masumin. And listen to them what they say in Persian. Uh, masumin means infallible. They cannot make any mistake because they are connected to Allah. And Allah, they, you laugh. They don't laugh. They mean it. They mean it. Totally. I can, I can prove it to you. I can show you. Here I have documents which prove it. And they actually view them as prophets who are connected to Allah. So who are those Americans and Canadians and Europeans, wine drinkers and swine eaters to tell them what to do and what not to do? Since when do Westerners have any right to tell them Uminin means the believers, the Shiites, what to do and what not to do. And this is how they look at things. Only when they sense a credible threat, they adhere to the di directives which come from the West. That's all. Yeah. believe that you will fall in love with this. Yes, sir. Yes. You, you said um, a couple of things, the two different states, the Islamic type states versus a regular state, a regular army. But knowing the mindset that they only understand threat, the only one is so strong or something, a credible threat. Credible threat. Okay. Uh, these Islamic states are, are more potent, right? I mean, Hezbollah is more potent than, than a, a certain country. But their whole goal is to destroy us, anyways. So why why is there a different mind frame? Why isn't that Israel doesn't take the same approach as they would? If there's, are they concerned about the civilian? Like they're trying to be so <coughs> generous to these people. Why can't they use planes to bomb these Islamists and just finish them off, just like a state? Imagine a situation. In the house, uh, the mother is cooking lunch for the for the. And please forgive me for characterizing. Uh, this is in the Middle East. The woman is cooking. The grandmother is ironing uh, the laundry. Uh, the grandfather is reading a book in the in the living room. The kids are playing in their room, and uh, the daughter is playing uh, piano in the in, in the living room. And the father is launching a missile from the basement towards Israel. And we know it. What can you do? Can you bomb the house yes. with a daughter near the piano and the kids in the playroom and the grandfather who reads and the grandmother, the grandmother who irons and the mother who cooks? Oh no. Yes. Oh, yes. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. I, I ask this question and I ask. Does the international law have anything to say about this? And don't forget, that the father is not an army man. He doesn't wear any uh, uniform. He's not part of any army. And, and uh, all the laws of war were tailored for armies, not for civilians who launch missiles. So uh, I, 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 I looked at, uh, at the crowd. What does the international law say about this? There is no solution in the international law because this situation was not foresaw by those who formulated 
the international law because they never thought that there will, there will be such a situation where a man with no uniform, doesn't belong to any army, launches from his basement and, 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 uh, a missile against another country when all his family is in the house. What war is this? What kind of war is this? Is this war? What kind of war? So he said there is no answer in the international law to this situation. Is he a combatant? Is he not? Is he a warrior? Is he not? Is he a soldier? Is he not a soldier? He's not a soldier. He's not registered in any army in the world. So what can he do with this? Arabs who live on the other side, on our side of the Jordan, and Jordan is the natural boundary between the Palestinian state and Israel, do they still not possess, in, in terms of international law, Jordanian citizenship? Ah. You must refer to the 1920 decisions of the San Remo conference, which gave the Jewish nation, which before the mandate, the mandate was 19, 19, 1923, right? But the, the San Remo decisions, San Remo convention from 1920 gave the Jewish nation the land of Israel. The Jewish nation, not the Israelis. The Jewish nation means people who live in Thornhill, Canada, Thornhill, Ontario, are eligible to the land of Israel, not less than Israeli citizens. The world is so. So the, the, it is tremendous uh, thing. People sometimes uh, ignore it. Everyone who is Jewish has a part in the land of Israel, not according to the, to the Bible or to the divine promise, according to the, one of the most founding, most important uh, uh, documents of the modern international law. Uh, Jean Gautier, your, your neighbor, uh, wrote about this, a whole book, and uh, our grief and uh, some others. Same question almost, why hasn't there been a resistance to occupation in Jordan by the Palestinians. Why aren't, why isn't Jordan? First of all, there was. Well, just why is it not going now? Just to remind you, 1970, September, what happened in Jordan? Yes. Remember, Black September? Yes. How many Palestinians were slaughtered by the, by the Iranian, by, by the Jordanian 3, army? 3, because they actually made a state within a state with roadblocks, with the... Uh, I mean, they never stopped fighting Israel. Why did they stop fighting Jordan? Why did they stop the fight over there? Because they were slaughtered to them. What do you mean? <laughs> so if Israel did that to the Palestinians, they'd also stop once it was. Israel doesn't do it. 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 Because we are, we try to be a bit more humane. The Palestinians are afraid to revolt today in Jordan. And what would happen if Palestine, with Israel, had a border with Jordan? Why would that threaten Jordan? We have border in, with Jordan. No, but if Palestinian independent state had a border with Jordan, yes. why would that be a threat to Jordan? First of all, they are afraid of um, irredent, irredentic uh, activities between the Palestinian state and the Palestinian majority, which right, right, right behind the Jordan River. So it, it will be a threat. Secondly, the Palestinians will be uh, eligible, according to the international law, to demand, to demand half of the water of the Jordan River from Israel and from Jordan. Uh, I won't get into a matter of legal, legal, legal problems related to the water, but definitely it will ha harm the Jordanian uh, uh, agriculture. Now they have to distill water and to buy more water, and they don't want to start messing with this issue. So uh, between this and that, the security and the water, they don't want to see any Palestinian state near them. Maybe on the mountains far from Israel. By the way, Jordan today, the, the Jordanian king, Abdal, is one of the biggest advocates of establishing a Palestinian state inside Israel, means inside the West Bank of Judea and Samaria. Unlike his father, who didn't want even to, to talk about this. He denied it totally. Uh, he changed this policy for his reasons, and I don't agree with him. But I always ask, ask uh, this question, and the Jordanians have never answered me. The West Bank was occupied by Jordan 
between 1948 and 1967. Altogether, almost 20 years, some 7,000 days, if you calculate. And Jerusalem, East Jerusalem, was under their occupation, as you will all remember. Why didn't they establish a Palestinian state with Jerusalem as its capital, as they claim today? And this, this is all, I always say that when, when I have to face them in the media, and they say, no, Israel should give the Palestinians a state in the West Bank. You know why they now advocate it? Today they advocate it. If, they, if there will be a Palestinian state, especially with Jerusalem as a capital, they will be able to tell their own Palestinians that if you want independence, you go to the West Bank. If you live here, you live under our rule. If you want to be national, independent uh, Palestinians, you have a choice to emigrate to your state. Just like here, in people, uh, Jewish people in Thornhill, Ontario, if they want to live as independent Jews in their own country, they take El Al, within 12 hours they are in their own independent sovereign country with Israeli citizenship. Okay? The same thing, the same thing, uh, Abdallah will tell his Palestinians, go to Palestine if you want to be independent, and if you stay here, you better shut up. This is why he wants a Palestinian state. Uh, so I always ask, okay, so if you so, if, if you advocate so willingly the establishing of a Palestinian state in the West Bank, why didn't you do it when you occupied it? Until uh, 1967, when nobody in the world could prevent it. What do you know today that you didn't know then? Okay, Jews, this is the part, this is the answer. Jews are there. Means, as long as it, you had it, no, no Palestinian state. Ah, once the Jews take their country, their, their land, which was promised to them by the, by the world in 1920, ah, now there, there should be Palestinian state. Is there a Syrian people? Yes. Is there an Iraqi people? Is there, is, are the modern states succeeded? And the modern states succeeded to unify everybody, and today everybody feels are like an Iraqi. I'm not talking about us, I'm talking about them. Is there a Libyan people? Forget about it. Forget. Is there a Sudani people? All these, all these things are fictions which were created by the colonialism, which never succeeded to replace the loyalty of the people to the tribe or to the ethnic group. Okay, you, you agree with me. So the, just like there is a Syrian people, or an Iraqi, and Libyan people, and Sudan people, there is a Palestinian people. You know, they don't get married with each other. A girl from Hebron has no option to marry a boy from Shechem. You know why? You understand this? Nicht kanunzeres. Okay? As we say in Arabic. So, tell me about a Palestinian people. There is no people. And if there is such Palestinian people, why did they keep their brothers? Brothers who ran away from Khadera and from Yafu in refugee camps until this very day. Marginalized, impoverished, because they are one people and start managing the world from out of the waters. Yes, sir. I got a question. I have, um, basically, going back to Iran and the role behind Russia, Putin. And then? The role behind Putin. Russia. Okay. You didn't mention much about Russian, you know, uh, helping, influencing Iran and, and basically getting them out of the, the hot water. And uh, I just wanted to hear your take about it. Port. Syrian port. Look. In my view, and I'm not an expert on uh, Russian policy, domestic issues. In my view, there is a struggle. Uh, once we knew about the Cold War between the Soviet Union and the West, what we see today is more or less the same thing. Today, it's not, uh, it's not called the Soviet Union, it's called Russia. But basically, it's the same thing, it's Moscow. And Putin actually thinks in the same <coughs> method of Brezhnev and Kosygin. You know, uh, hardliner uh, from the same point of view. As you might know, he was also uh, in the KG. So uh, this, 
And I think this is the basis of what was happening today. They are trying to fish uh, all kinds of states, which will be in their camp. Once it was uh, East Germany and Romania and Poland and uh, Hungary, Hungary. And today is Iran, Venezuela, and North Korea, maybe. So this is, they are shaping an alliance with other countries, which are all aimed at challenging the Western, Western world in any way. So they support each other, they defend each other. This is the context, or this is the background of, of, of what I think is, uh, is the, Yes, sir. Is there any good news? <laughs> yes. Small question. Uh, I heard on the news about a week ago about protests Americans in Israel about difficulties obtaining refugee status. Is that a They don't have any refugee status. They came from Egypt. In Egypt, but not in Israel. You know, a refugee, according to the international law, is one time refugee pistol. Except well, for Palestinians. Refugees is a totally different question. I'm talking about those, those Africans. Many of them came from just as uh, foreign workers to, to, look, to look for work. Uh, illegally entered Israel, so they are actually criminals. Uh, look, if somebody comes to Lod without permission, that's a foreign country which Israel does not let, and he tries to enter Israel illegally, what will be his fate? Just like somebody who comes to, uh, to, uh, to Toronto International Airport and tries to get into Canada without permission. Without permission. What will happen to him? Either deported or put in jail. So what do they expect? That Israel treats them in another way? Of course they do. Why should, why should Israel do they, they are illegally in Israel. No documents, no nothing. Ah, some of them already in some, they brought in the media, Israel media a, a demonstration like two weeks ago of those uh, foreign workers. And they, they are Muslims, many of them, came from Eritrea and other countries, Islamic countries like Sudan. They call it. This is Palestine. This is not Israel. This is the state doesn't belong to you. They tell us that this country doesn't belong to us. We give them a medical treatment. We give them shelter. We give them food. And this country doesn't belong to us. Okay? What would you do with them? So that's what Israel tries to do. But all kinds of uh, bleeding hearts uh, prevent, prevent it to be done, you know, in large scale. So we do it on a small scale. Thank you very much. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.